Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. The Road to Autonomy is brought to you in part by Stantec Generation AV. Stantec Generation AV combines some of the most experienced AV experts in the industry with the resources of a global engineering firm. Stantec Generation AV provides education, consulting, assessment, and guidance to any industry interested in autonomous vehicles. Learn more at Stantec.com. Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to welcome David Hangren, Investment Director, Volvo Group Venture Capital. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be on your podcast. I'm excited to have you here because the Volvo Group will play a vital role in the future of autonomous trucking. You're well on your way. But before we get into autonomy, for our listeners, I want to paint a picture of who the Volvo Group is. It's an impressive organization. It has a $31 billion market cap. It's one of the world's largest manufacturers of heavy-duty trucks, construction equipment, buses, heavy-duty engines, and I think it's the coolest marine industrial engines for boats, with trucks accounting for 60% of sales. How do all these businesses complement each other? We are a large producer, like you say, and the business is really doing well. Sales and market shares are up versus last year, and we're earning a lot of money, which we invest in new technologies. But like you asked, how does really all our businesses complement? For once, all our businesses are B2B, and we're a leader in almost all of our business areas. And you mentioned it, we do heavy equipment. We do not make the cars. Unfortunately, they're really great, but that's not part of Volvo Group. Within the group, we have a terminology. We call it cost, which means common architecture, shared technology, which means that we share a lot of components like powertrain, electric architecture, cabs, axles, batteries. A lot of things underneath in the products are shared, and we complement each other in development. In the future, all of the products will also be electrified. We're working on teleoperation and autonomy for all of the product lines. We're also moving from products to services in all of the product lines, and there's a lot of common things in that development. One recent example is the recently introduced electric trucks, which you've seen, I hope. Technology in those uh, was transferred from our bus division, which had been electrified for quite a long time before. Wow. So... I love the cost analogy with the shared technology, the buses to trucks to me that says, okay, here's an example of the group learning together. So were the engineers from the bus team, do they get together with the engineers from the truck team and the things that they learn, say, around range, performance around different weather conditions of how the battery reacts? Was all that, it's called institutional knowledge shared with the trucking side of the house? Yeah, and I would say it's not uh, one bus team and one truck team. It's very much integrated within the company. So... Uh, it's all co-located, and uh, I think the engineers don't necessarily view themselves as a bus or a truck person. There's a common denominator across the group. Volvo Group makes reliable products. You make really great manufactured products. And the best part, if I'm a business buying your products, your products last and they're reliable. So go team Volvo Group on that front. David, as I mentioned earlier, a trucks account for 60% of sales. And you mentioned earlier that the group is still growing. Do you view that heavy-duty truck market as a growth market, even though you have 60% of sales currently coming from that? Yes, we actually do. And that's uh, because even though we have really strong uh, presence and good growth within the trucks today, it's very much centered around the equipment and the truck itself. But there are plenty of new growth areas. And most importantly is that we as a group are trying to move from a product-centric company. It's 100 years old, you know. So we're great at uh, building the hardware, but we're moving from hardware to services. And within the service area, I mean, there are so many things. Productivity solutions. Customers want to uh, see better productivity and not necessarily just new features. Fleet management, fleet management solutions, charging, route simulations, equipment as a service. The list is very long, I could uh, list the different services, and that's where we see a lot of growth. We also created two new business areas. Apart from bus, trucks, and construction equipment, we've just created Volvo Autonomous Solutions, uh, focusing on uh, autonomous transport systems, and also Volvo Energy, which is a business area focusing on the charging and the energy supply to all of the products. So we're strong in machine sales, but the real growth will be in the new service area. 
you're taking two of the hottest markets globally, the, the, the transition to zero carbon and, and energy as that market grows, the growth of autonomy that's continuing to grow. And I think as we can all agree, and most listeners will agree, the first practical real applications will be in heavy duty autonomous trucks. Equipment as a service, I've been speaking to a lot of bankers on Wall Street and a lot of industrial banks around the world, and equipment as a service is a trend that's coming up. How do you see equipment as a service rolling out? Will it be, let's just call it Acme customer, will subscribe to a a Volvo truck, and then they will pay you a fixed fee very similar to a lease? Or how do you see that rolling out? Equipment as a service is something uh, that we are um, already trying out in selected areas. So it's not something that we see uh, us starting within a few years. We're already trying it out on trucks and on construction equipment. But here, we also think that it's very important to listen to the customer. So some customers will still want to purchase equipment. Some will want to lease, but some will also want to pay per mile or per hour or in different models. You're giving balance sheet flexibility to your customers depending on where their their business growth projections are and how they want to manage their cash flow. Will that equipment as a service, will that carry over into autonomous trucks? Do you see that carrying over into that segment of the business eventually as well? Yes. First of all, I can say that on the autonomous side, we do not plan to sell an autonomous truck. We will provide a transport service, both on-road or off-road. This we do uh, via this business area called Volvo Autonomous Solutions. And they are uh, focusing on three different areas. One is mining and quarries. One is port and logistics, and then hub to hub on road. So in all of these, we plan to offer a full transport service and not uh, selling an autonomous truck. Is that how you're positioning yourself to continue the revenue growth that Volvo Group is seeing at the group level? Yes, yes, by providing a a full transport solution. It's really savvy. You look at what's happening globally with mining. You can use Western Australia, for example, or you can use Canada, where new mines are coming online to meet the lithium and cobalt and nickel demand for electric vehicles. And there is a shortage of equipment there. And there's a labor shortage. A lot of individuals, you can read these reports in Perth, Australia, they don't like flying and going to the mining and then going home week on, week off. That's a really great solution for autonomous mining equipment that Volvo can capture significant market share there, similar to how you've done in trucking. And on the autonomous trucking side, Volvo Autonomous Solutions has a partnership with Aurora to jointly develop on-highway autonomous trucks in the U.S., Could you talk about that partnership, please? So Aurora, a great company, by the way, we announced a partnership with them in uh, 2021, but we're actually working with them. I don't know when it really started, but I remember a project back in 2018. So we had been working for quite a number of years together. And the partnership focuses to develop an autonomous transport solution for hub to hub in North America. But it's not a traditional... uh, situation where an OEM is supplying a truck and Aurora is developing the software. We do this together. So we have hundreds of engineers working on the uh, virtual driver and we do it together with Aurora. So we want to develop a self-driving transportation service together with them. And in the end, when it's all ready, Volvo will then offer a transport service to our customers. So I would say together we will make it happen. And I can also mention that the partnership with Aurora is not exclusive, so we wish to work with many more partners in this field, not just Aurora. It's savvy. You're going to build the transport business, and I'm going to use the term heritage. So you ha- you're, you're a heritage B2B company. You're going to be able to offer your global customers a choice. You can have Aurora or you can have a Solution 2, Solution 3, because perhaps it works better in a certain region. So well done to the Volvo group there. You're in the venture capital side of the house. What role does the venture capital group play in this decision process? Are you rolling up your sleeves and doing due diligence and talking to individuals? What role does venture capital play in this decision? Yeah, this is my favorite question. I've been working a long time at Volvo. Uh, The question you ask is maybe one of the reasons why I joined the venture capital team in the first place. I don't even want to tell you when I started, but I'm a bit of a dinosaur. So I've been doing many different jobs within Volvo. I remember when I was doing product management, my belief was that we do everything in-house. Every time someone came with a suggestion to me or a new product request, we calculated 
you know, how much time it would take and how many engineering hours it would take. And after doing that a couple of years, and I just saw that we were not the quickest in the market, I thought there must be a better way of doing this. There must be some other way of bringing new technology to the market. And that's why I joined the, the venture capital team. So we're, we're now 25 years. I started 2016. But it's so we're one of the oldest CVCs in, out there. But we want to be one of the ways to transform Volvo from a product-centric company to a service-oriented company. We see ourselves as an important piece of the puzzle. Why was the venture group started? Was there just a need, as you mentioned, to pivot to services? Was it a desire to, to explore new technologies and to own a piece of that technology if it, if it scales and have a successful exit or to eventually integrate it into the Volvo group as a strategic offering? Why was the group started? It's also interesting because we're celebrating 25 years this year. So I look back uh, some time ago in the documentation, see how it got started. And it was just before the dot-com bubble. The idea was to uh, be a catalyst between uh, Volvo and the outside world to add competences and uh, connect interesting startups with Volvo. Of course, like any traditional VC, also get return on the invested capital and have a global scope. When I look at it, it's very similar to uh, how we operate today. So I think it, it's been very, very consistent over the years. There is consistency there. There's consistency, as I said earlier, in the quality of the products that you sell to your customers. And we've talked a lot about services and Volvo's looking at equipment as a service in various different ways to increase service revenue. With the companies that are in your portfolio, are you helping them to accelerate their business miles into it as a service offering? I would say the most of the companies that we have in our portfolio, they are service-oriented companies. But what we do from the venture capital side is, of course, to connect them with our company in various ways to find uh, new business opportunities, new markets. There's a lot of opportunities to do when you collaborate with a big company like Volvo. There's a lot of opportunities there. You're doing a lot of really good things. I like the way that the strategy that Volvo is taking towards autonomous trucking. You're saying we're operating a non-exclusive partnership with Aurora. We're looking for new partnerships. And I want to put on my economic hat here for a minute because we're in the period of, let's call it global uncertainty. We could go into a global recession. We saw what happened during COVID with the supply chain, the spike in inflation in the United States, which is currently pegged at 8.3%. We're seeing what's happening in, in Europe with the energy crisis. To me, all this says and screams is opportunity for autonomous trucking because autonomous trucks will be able to shore up the supply chain to be able to move goods without causing inflation. How is Volvo actively preparing for autonomous trucks to scale with this backdrop? We have uh, new solutions being developed for uh, ports, logistic terminals, mines, quarries, hub to hub and highway. The way for us to scale this not to work through our traditional channels. So we set up this Volvo Autonomous Solutions business area, which includes both development, sales, commercialization, everything is in this unit. And it works like uh, in parallel with uh, the trucks, like Volvo trucks, Mac trucks, with its own profit and loss. And in order for to scale this, we're working in four main areas. So one is that we're developing this uh, virtual driver we develop our own in-house virtual driver, but we also partner with companies like NVIDIA, Aurora, and, and potentially also with other companies developing virtual drivers. Secondly, we also want to scale by using autonomy on all our brands, Volvo, Mac, Renault, and possibly other brands. We also plan to scale in not only the US, but also Europe and Asia. And lastly, we also want to offer complete transport solution. But in addition, we are also open to other business models like equipment as a service, vehicle as a service, for example. So in the middle of all of this, we have a truck, which is, we could call it autonomy enabled with a well-defined interface. And we plan to scale with many different drivers, many different markets, many different products. You're laying the groundwork for the future. There's no other way to describe it. You're clearly laying the groundwork for the future. Why is Volvo looking at the hub-to-hub -hub model? Is that where you feel that the autonomous trucks will first be rolled out, first introduced? Or are you looking at it from an economic standpoint where 
it makes the most sense economically. Yeah, hub to hub is uh, from an economic perspective, like you say, a very interesting um, area. The trucking market in the US specifically is very well suited for this. I would say that we started the other way around because we've been doing autonomy and teleoperation for quite some time within uh, construction equipment, within mines and quarries, and that the learnings from there are then transferred into the hub to hub. But which ones that will scale uh, first? I'm not sure. So if you had asked me a few years ago, I would say clearly that it would be the, the off-road side, the mining. But the pace in development and commercialization of hub to hub is going very, very fast now. So it might be quite close to each other, I would say. You're based in Europe. Is Europe, in your opinion, prepared for hub to hub? Does Europe have the room and the land to put the infrastructure in place for hub to hub? We believe so, but we believe that we will start in the U.S. Yeah, I like that you said that you're going to go into Asia. I could definitely see the technology starting in the United States, generating revenue, if you want to ter- use the term scaling or, or moving abroad to Europe, then followed by Asia and the APAC region. I think that's going to be a common trend across the industry with all the autonomy partners. And then looking at the traditional trucking industry, there's a really interesting stat that stood out to me. Over the last 12 months, 249,000, I repeat, 249,000 Class 8 Orders were placed and dealers are sold out for all of 2023. There's a global driver shortage. In your opinion, what's driving the demand for all these heavy-duty trucks? I think that if I look back a couple of years, uh, there is a constant increase in the demand for trucks. It goes a little bit up and down, but there is an increased demand for freight. And as we know, people are buying a lot of things online. And right now, there's a huge backlog and parts shortage. Right now, there's a very high demand for freight. You said that many companies are sold out for 2023. I don't think we are. I hope that we can take more orders. Overall, we see an increasing demand for freight going forward. The increased demand for freight, in my opinion, is a global trend. It's not going to be isolated to Europe or to the United States or Australia, for that matter. When do we get to a point where Class 8 trucks are sold as a subscription service? You're currently looking at it for other types of equipment, but when do we get to the point where Class 8 trucks are sold as a subscription? I maybe touched upon that earlier, but we are already uh, testing this. We're offering it in some selected areas. What's interesting is that uh, with the introduction of the electric trucks, it will be even more relevant than with the traditional trucks. When we are uh, now starting to sell the electric trucks, this is much more common to offer the usage-based service or per mile. And with the autonomy, of course, it will be transportation as a service. So I would say that it's increasing and it will increase even more with the electrics going coming in. The electric trucks, it, it's new technology, but it also enables you to develop a new business plan, a new financial model. And then you're based in Europe, as I said earlier, Volvo has a 42%, I repeat, a 42% market share for electric heavy-duty trucks. How is Volvo able to gain such a significant market share? Yeah, I remember when um, a few years ago, autonomy was very hot. We were working hard on that. And and one day we saw a, a Tesla electric truck being presented. Even though we were already developing electric trucks, it put some uh, like an afterburner on the uh, development side. And now it seems like we have had maybe a bit of a first mover advantage because we have had regional electric trucks in production since 2019. Just a month ago or two, we have now our heavy-duty trucks in serial production. We did not start from zero, so we had a lot of experience from the bus operation, which had been electric for quite some time. And on the production side, we use the same factories. It's interesting, but a truck, there's so many variants, you know, with the refuse, concrete, construction, by using the same mixed model technology, then we have been able to have electric trucks in a lot of different variants. And I think that is also helping us to increase the sales quite a lot. So we're really excited about how this has started. It ties into the company's cost model. Amazon, I want to highlight, is taking possession of 20 Volvo heavy-duty electric trucks in Germany by the end of the year, 2022. The interesting part to point out 
is the trucks are projected to drive over 621,000 miles a year. 621,000 miles a year. That's a lot of miles from an engineering perspective. How is this possible? I have to, I'm a kilometer guy, you know, so, <laughs> but uh, I think that's for 20 trucks. If you divide it by uh, per truck, the range for an electric truck is 300 kilometers. And then uh, if you uh, recharge during the day, it will be 500 kilometers. In my perspective, it's not so challenging. Is that what Volvo Energy is focused on is the recharging aspect? So when you sell to a public customer, Amazon, you can also help with the recharging of a heavy duty electric truck? Yeah, uh, good question. Exactly. So there's no point in selling an electric truck to someone and not helping them with how to run their operation or how to charge. So that's precisely the reason why we have Volvo Energy all the way from uh, helping the customers to charge, to provide energy, but also to take care of second life batteries. So everything, I would say, outside of the traditional truck, that's Volvo Energy. And Volvo Energy, second life, is that, are you referencing recycling or reuse, perhaps putting it in storage for an office or for a home? Yeah, exactly. It could be both. I think we're interested to see the uh, opportunities in uh, using the batteries in new applications, maybe in a, in a charging station or in a house, for example. With the Amazon trucks being deployed in Germany, I did some research on Germany here, and I want to point out 36% of Germany's domestic transport emissions comes from heavy good vehicles and other commercial vehicles. There's a global trend towards decarbonization. Does that become the wind at your back to help Volvo's electrification business scale and grow as, as Germany and the EU start putting pressure to reduce carbon emissions across the continent? I think it's always been in the DNA of Volvo. When I started, so this, like I said a very long time ago, we had something, it was, we call it quality, safety, and environment. Those were the, what we worked towards and tried to accomplish. Environment has always been in the center when we develop new products and services. And right now we have the widest and broadest range of products. I spoke to a colleague the other day in the US and he said, David, we're kicking ass on the electrics. He was really excited. But the plan forward is that in 2030, half of all the products that we sell will be zero emissions. So either electric or with the fuel cell technology. And in 2040, which is less than 20 years away, then uh, all of the new sales should be zero emissions. And then we hope by 2050, the entire running fleet will then be zero emissions. That's a big change. That's a big change. Are your customers actively embracing the transition towards zero emissions? Yes, definitely. I think the, the demand is higher than uh, what we currently can supply, but we're struggling to get there, to grow this as quickly as possible. The demand's higher. I give Volvo Group credit. You're not getting caught flat-footed. A lot of the car companies were caught flat-footed by the demand there, and they weren't able to secure the supply chains. Volvo says, okay, we're going to build an energy company. We're going to vertically integrate this, and we're going to be prepared for this transition to 2050 by the entire time our running fleet could be zero emissions. During that time from today to 2050, technology is going to change. Battery chemistries are going to change. Your trucks will be able to run longer miles. They'll be able to recharge faster. How do you see the electrification of heavy-duty trucks evolving over the next decade? So from today, there will be a gradual uh, shift. So the traditional combustion engine, the portion of that, of the total sales, will diminish every year. We don't think it will disappear totally, but I would say by 2040 or so, the traditional internal combustion engine will account for a very small portion but it will then also be fueled by fossil-free fuels. It could be electric fuels produced by windmills, or it can be uh, other biofuels or so. There will be a gradual shift from uh, traditional um, combustion engines to electric and fuel cell electric, of course. Fuel cells going to be fascinating to see what watch. Another thing that's going to be fascinating to see what happens is entrepreneurs. There's a growing number of entrepreneurs that want to work to solve the climate crisis. You're a strategic investor. What can you offer to these entrepreneurs that say, okay, David, we want to solve the climate crisis. We want to introduce better technology for batteries. We want to introduce better zero emissions technology. What can you offer them? Yeah, 
our name is Volvo Group Venture Capital, so we are a corporate venture, and sometimes they are a little bit different than traditional VCs. But apart from the obvious uh, that we can come with growth capital, we can offer so many more things. We can connect the companies with our uh, industry and product experts, and they can learn from us. We're present in every continent, in almost every country in the, on the globe, and an entrepreneur can then uh, get a global outreach through us. We have access to our top management. If we, For those companies where we have invested, we have very high attention from the Volvo's top management. We have a lot of projects we can do together and a testing ground. If uh, someone has uh, developed a new technology and want to try it out, we have great possibility to do so. And we are also long-term, so we're quite stable as an investor. That's what we need in these turbulent times. You need a long-term investor that's committed to seeing it through. We're going to see consolidation enter the space. We're going to see a lot of startups go out of business. And if you have a long-term partner that's committed to you, you will eventually succeed. Overall, what are the strategic advantages to working with Volvo Group Venture Capital? I would say the one difference towards many corporate venture firms is that Maybe a wrong put, but we care a lot about the well-being of the startup. So our focus is not on how can Volvo just profit. Our focus is on how can we help the startup to develop. For that reason, we don't introduce any strange terms in our investment. We have no acquisition agenda. We don't like exclusivities. We like to invest in startups that have many customers outside of Volvo so that they can prosper and that, that they can become a winner. That's how we think it's a winning formula to get the best startups to want to work with us. I like the Volvo Group's approach to non-exclusivity. If you exclusive, you could potentially limit the growth trajectory of that startup or that partner. In your opinion, what is the future of Volvo Group Venture Capital? Uh, I just hope that we will uh, grow even more as a team, uh, become more active in more areas, and invest more. Today, I think we're limited by what we're capable of to do as a team. So I hope that we will uh, just grow and do more investments in more areas going forward. Well, David, with you on the team, there's no doubt on my mind that the Volvo Group Venture Capital will continue to grow. You'll continue to make strategic investments. You'll continue to do strategic partnerships. You'll, and for the Volvo Group as a whole, there's no doubt on my mind you'll continue to gain market share and the heavy duty trucks, especially electrification, because I'm a fan of what you're doing with the integration with Volvo Energy. And David, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners take away with them today? I'd like them to um, remember that we believe that collaboration is key to transformation of our industry. We think that uh, in the ocean, there are lots of species and a large whale could be us, then they can come up with a pretty good idea. But sometimes it's the smallest fish that comes up with the brightest idea. And big ideas, they can come from anywhere at any time. So our message is that if you want to shape the world that we want to live in, then uh, come and work with us and let's do it together. Reach out to David with your big idea. Volvo Group is clearly all about collaboration. As David said, collaboration is key because the future is bright, the future is autonomous, and the future is Volvo Group Venture Capital. David, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O. Com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice.